right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Valeria Whitler, and welcome to our webinar about field studies and systems innovation. It is hosted by Systems Innovation Hub Berlin, a newly founded space for systems thinking and doing in Berlin. So today's panel will showcase different application examples of systems innovation by several organizations in Berlin. I'm assuming that many of you will be familiar with systems thinking or systems innovation in one way or another. But for those of you who are not, I will give a brief introduction into the topic before we start with the speaker's presentations. So what is systems innovation and why is it a pivotal concept in the 21st century? With the rise of globalization and the use of technology in every aspect of our lives, um, sorry, one second, um, the rising interconnectedness and pace of change uh, increases the overall complexity of our world. And this happened in the past decade alone. So when issues become complex, there's no simple solution. Outcomes are emergent, phenomena of the way the system is organized as a whole, and the dynamics are nonlinear and unpredictable. So from climate change to development aid, poverty, and the current global pandemic, these so-called wicked problems that are emergent systemic dysfunctionalities cannot simply be solved with linear problem-solving tools that have been employed during the past century and are still in use in many companies, organizations, and in our governments today. So what is required to tackle these challenges? It's a, a systems-informed perspective and a complex intervention. Systems innovation is a relatively new idea that has come out of the more theoretical systems thinking and is bridging the gap between the complex challenges we face today and these mis mismatched tools by providing practical approaches to such complex interventions that can create transformative change of the system's underlying structure instead of merely mitigating unwanted system outcomes in the short term. So um, this is the short introduction. If you have any questions at any point during the webinar, you can post them in the YouTube chat box and I will pick them up later uh, when we come back to the discussion part of the webinar. So let me introduce today's speakers. Our first speaker today is Oliver Baer. He's a consultant with Endeavor, a leading development consultancy in Berlin. And he's a systems facilitator seeking to translate systems innovation practices to fit the corporate agenda and enable innovation with impact. Next, we have Sebastian Vetter, who is the founder of Hacking Cultural Beliefs. He will talk about radical innovation, an approach to innovation that uses social anthropology to identify cultural beliefs for transformative in innovation. And then finally, we'll end off with Ina Cilic, who is an experienced ex executive advisor, innovations and change facilitator. And she will speak about her work at Climate Kick a knowledge and innovation community, working with transformative systemic innovation to accelerate the transition towards a zero carbon climate resilient society. So without any further ado, I give you the floor, Oliver. <laughs> okay, good evening, everybody. It's nice to be here. Thanks for the interest. Um, let me... Okay, do you see this uh, daunting picture with wicked problems on it? Yes, perfect. Okay, um, so um, I'm working with Endeavor. Endeavor is a, a consultancy that um, facilitates system change. And I will explain you what it is, what that means, and I will try to go beyond the buzzwords because um, in this field that that I'm active in and that Endeavor is in, there are unfortunately a lot of buzzwords flying around. I will kind of use them as well, but make it tangible and bring you some examples uh, towards the end of uh, my little pitch. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, you all better understand what we're doing and what it is all about. So we already heard there's many wicked problems out there. We know since many years that you know our current systems and our business logic is flawed. We hope that we can have unlimited growth, but we only have a limited amount of resources, fundamentally thought. It's generated wealth in the last decades, and businesses thrive, but also produced and uh, produce these wicked problems, which we cannot delay into the future anymore. Climate warming, wealth, uh, inequality, pollution, access to health, resource depletion, 
all things that, um, uh, all challenges that are wicked, that are complex, that cannot be easily solved. And all these challenges also confront businesses. Not only the coronavirus shakeup showed how economies suffer from their direct and indirect impact of wicked problems. Businesses saw their complex supply chains collapse, uh, customer demand uh, nearly stopped. No one went shopping anymore. And new policies uh, came into the game. But already before that, a rather quiet but remarkable revolution has manifested itself. We saw it with Fridays for Future. We saw it when the Green New Deal was announced. We saw it when the CEO of BlackRock, one of the biggest uh, investment banks, demanded his fellow CEOs to integrate ESG uh, metrics into their reporting and uh, uh, called them to act more uh, sustainably and impact driven. Businesses have to play their part in solving these wicked problems. So let's not see it that dark. Let's see it, oh. let's better see it a little bit brighter. We can build back better and we can build back uh, sustainably and we can solve these wicked problems. We have to understand the crisis, the chance to initiate real action now. Right now is the time for transformational change. Um, and acting sustainable and following the sustainable development goals of the UN is not a nice to have anymore, it's a must have. And businesses are right in the midst of it all. In recent years, uh, this so-called purpose revolution that I was telling you about has been brewing. It came with the change in terms of what employees, customers, and investors expect from businesses. Employees want a more meaningful job. Customers want to purchase products feeling less guilty. And investors realize that doing good is simply good business. Recent studies show that companies that act sustainably and purpose-driven are the ones that perform better financially. So all the most, uh, so all the important stakeholders of a business uh, demand these businesses and our businesses are in our world to become more purpose-driven. What is purpose? Purpose, you know, can be defined as a fundamental reason why a company exists. It's used to describe uh, the shareholder value, like increasing profits. That uh, a few decades ago kind of was the purpose of most companies. This is changing. This is this purpose revolution I was uh, talking about. These days can rather be defined as making life better now and in the future for all stakeholders. So what does that mean? I say companies, turn your company purpose into action now. Pioneering leaders define clear purpose, turn it into action and integrate it deep into their strategy. They play their part in solving these wicked problems in their industries, ensure that all stakeholders benefit. I say now is the time to solve these big challenges, to be bold and to lead the industry that they're active in into a new normal, a new normal where business interests and social and environmental benefits can be merged. So what does that mean? What does it mean to turn a company purpose into action? Well, first of all, we're talking here about actions and uh, projects that connect to the core purpose of a uh, core purpose of a company that's usually written down and is deeply rooted in the strategy of an organization. And second of all, we say it should be connected to the sustainable development goals. So for example, a plastic manufacturer, a company that produces plastics and you know all kinds of packaging, they might be interesting to drive, interested to drive the circular economy um, uh, and uh, to initiate actions there. An energy provider might want to transform his whole operations and become a, a sustainable energy provider. Important with all this is that turning purpose into action and solving we can challenges is not just a risk mitigation for these companies, it's not just an annoying thing. Turning purpose into action can have enormous business value and is one of the greatest opportunities to, to meet the demands of 
customers, employees, and investors uh, today and in the future. This can mean that these companies can create new markets at the bottom of the pyramid in low income uh, context and uh, uh, reach new customers there. They can apply that technology to new use cases, ones that have impact um, uh, deeply rooted within. Um, and importantly, it also shows to the customers and employees that their company is serious about their purpose and that their company is willing to act on it. So if a company wants to do something like that, wants to turn the purpose into action and initiate a project uh, respectively, what is important for us, what we see in our experience, it's basically two things. One is really to work across sectors. It's not just working with other private companies, not just working with a social startup, it's really going across uh, uh, different sectors, working with development agencies, with governments, with uh, foundations. There's many actors out there and the collaboration and the joining of forces with these different partners is key. And second, working on a system level proves to be the method and the approach that is most promising. And I will tell you in a bit um, why. But let's first go to an example. We as Endeavor, we in 2017, uh, initiated a uh, system change process. I will tell you in a bit what that is, but I first want to go through uh, the actual project with you. Um, in the end, the Drones Doing Good Alliance emerged. And the Drones Doing Good Alliance is a partnership between corporates and uh, um, public actors. And they want to make flying drones uh, in Africa, um, a reality, one that uh, helps the people that otherwise wouldn't have access uh, to infrastructure and to deliver critical goods. So there was an opportunity. There was an opportunity to put purpose into action. We actually work with Airbus. Uh, I guess all of you or most of you know it's a big uh, aero uh, space uh, uh, company. Airbus uh, had this vision to turn their purpose into action. They had aerospace technology, which were drones, and they asked themselves, how can we use this technology and apply it to a case where we make not just profit, but where we make profit and we do uh, good for all stakeholders involved. So what we did together with Airbus, we really defined a vision around this. We connected this with the eight SDGs, we defined goals and metrics, and we identified all different kinds of stakeholders very broadly. And what we did is we put them together. We let them work together. We let them collaborate and we let them together create solutions to the problem and the opportunity that we identified. That was with other corporates, that was with, uh, again, public and societal stakeholders, uh, and with startups. They all came together. They looked uh, first um, at the opportunity and then at the system around it and then try to understand, okay, what is the system? Why does something like that uh, not exist today? And what do we need to do to make such a vision come true? And they developed a action plan. How, like who needs to uh, uh, work on the system at which point, uh, who needs to put which of his resources into action so that in the end, the system changes for good. And uh, after 2017, as I told you, the Drone Sewing Good Alliance emerged. These, these actors joined forces and they built a long-term cross-sector partnership. They've tested already the first flights. They made an analysis when to fly uh, and, and where, we, where we can fly. They designed actually, a, a, so they took the, the basic uh, design of Airbus, but they adapted it to the African and the local context. Um, and they created a plan um, which consists of policy measures, infrastructure measures, and network um, measures uh, that all together would enable a system to change and to create an enabling environment for this solution. So why is system innovation 
and, and system thinking the, the tool that we're using and why, why wouldn't we just develop a solution with the company and then just try to implement it? Why are we going through all this systemic analysis? Why do we try and understand the root causes? Well, first of all, as I told you, and as, you, as, as we learned today, Wicked uh, already implies the complexity of a problem and of an opportunity. And to solve complexity, we need to work together. We've seen that in the last years, especially also in Deva with, with the work over the last 10 years, we have seen that one actor alone cannot really move the needle. We need to work together and we need to work together with uh, partners that have maybe a little bit different um, interests and objectives, but we need to join forces uh, and, uh, um, and, and build enabling environments for the solutions that we see. And system innovation is basically an, an, an approach and it's the underlying approach that perfectly fits to our agenda. This also delivers really new insights. You would talk to unlikely allies, like people and stakeholders you wouldn't have talked before. And uh, you really try to understand the root causes of a problem. Because what we could see is that over the last years, individual impact projects mostly died. They just basically just still not around anymore. If a corporate launched a social project somewhere on, on its own, most of them slowly died. So we, we assume and we think, and what we see is uh, this is due to an environment and a system that is basically not favorable and not enabling such new innovations and new, uh, new solutions. So we need to work on the system to make sure that in the end, the solution can also scale, that such a, such a project is not just a uh, greenwashing, nice to make a picture from project, um, but that's really a project that can scale. And that's why we need to work on the system level. And that's why we apply system thinking in our approach. What is our approach? Finally, we call it inclusive innovation. Inclusive innovation 2030, II 2030. It's fundamentally uh, three steps. So as I told you, first we start with an opportunity where we can see it has purpose, or it could, it could generate purpose and impact. And as I said, we, we, we look out and see as many uh, different uh, stakeholders as possible. We call this a consultation phase and try to understand the system, the system dynamics, the relationship between the different actors. And we go through in a phase where it's co-creation. Basically, the people sitting together and creating new solutions and solutions that would solve the, the problem and, and that, that helps us to pursue the opportunity. And, find, and finally, we go into an uh, implementation phase. Looks like this, people coming together from all different kinds of organizations, private and public, and trying to understand the system, what has actually happened and, and what do we need to do to change it? People on the ground, people here in Europe, co-create these kind of solutions and test it. And finally, we implement it. This, for example, is the drones doing good. So as you can see, LifeBank was one of the participants of the track uh, and they deliver critical medicine to remote areas in Africa now. And they've developed this drone design, which is specifically for this context. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, enables uh, Airbus on the one side to enter this market. And at the uh, other side, it helps the people in need to get medicine on time. We are usually working with a lot of different partners and uh, people that uh, uh, um, a part of our uh, processes. This was from 2017. Um, and again, inclusive innovation is a, proce a process to develop both solutions together. We co-create business models and solutions that integrate shared value. Shared value means to create business value and social and environmental value. We help to initiate system change and we know where to, which actor, which partner, needs to act where to change the system effectively. And finally, we catalyze long-term partnerships that really bring about change on the system level and help to implement the solution. This year, unfortunately, the people couldn't meet, but we had a, another a session this year. And uh, this is my last slide. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit long. Um, this is my last slide. 
uh, where we again work with Airbus and with GIZ uh, to explore how satellite technology could be used for small scale uh, for, for small farmers in, in rural Africa. This time it was all digital. We had over 50 different uh, uh, people and 30 or 40 different organizations. Uh, all over Zoom, you can imagine the chaos. Um, but I think it worked super nice and then we got very concrete and tangible results. Um, we worked on Miro to gather all our thoughts and to uh, uh, develop solutions that can have uh, impact and turn an organization's purpose into impact. So how to turn your organization's purpose into impact? If you would like to know more, just visit ii2030.com and we are very happy and I'm very happy to uh, co continue the conversation. And uh, with that, I'm sorry for taking a little bit too long, but... Uh, Thank you so much, Oliver. Um, it's quite interesting, this approach of inclusive innovation and kind of also building the ecosystem that will later give rise to more collaborations that will work in the same way. Really cool. So um, Sebastian will talk next about radical innovation. <laughs> it's, yes, I will, uh, Valeria. Uh, just give me a second to share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Nice, okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really enjoy being here and talking a bit about hacking cultural beliefs for radical innovation and organizational change. Um, I think the, the topic um, or the approach that we developed here, it, it goes hand in hand with systemic innovation. Yeah, but it looks at this from a different angle. And I will explain how it works in the, in the coming 15 minutes. So we are, we are a team of Hacking Culture Beliefs. These are my, my colleagues. Um, I wanna talk a bit about how I first noticed um, cultural beliefs and why I think they're really important for innovation. So I, I lived overseas, um, I lived in New Zealand for about five years. And that was really when I first understood the power uh, of cultural beliefs and how different societies have very different beliefs on almost anything, yeah? From how they spend their free time to how they work, how they innovate. Um, it's really something that is um, often very difficult to see once you're embedded in a system, in a society. And I worked as an innovation consultant uh, for most of my career. Um, applying human-centered design methods, design thinking, uh, facilitating ideation sessions, and so on. And um, I always found it very difficult for participants to actually come up with actually innovative ideas. Yeah, Most of the ideas that, um, that participants came up with, there were just iterations of things that already existed. But very rarely there was anything which was a radical innovation. And um, you might know this, um, or many facilitators actually ask participants to think outside of the box. And uh, I, I have, to, um, have to say I did that as well. Um, but I realized you need to ask yourself, what is the box made of? Yeah, so if you, if you don't ask yourself that question, what is the box that we are in? What is this box made of? Then it's impossible to think outside of your box. And um, I believe the walls of that box, they are constructed by our cultural beliefs. And the good news is that we can actually hack uh, our own cultural beliefs and use that for radical innovation. Okay, um, for for about like five to 10 years, there has been talk about um, the finance revolution, yeah, uh, the fintech revolution. And there are lots of startups out there who set out to revolutionize finance. And on the left-hand side, you see a bank um, about 100 years ago. And on the right-hand side, you see like this is even a, a German um, fintech who digitalized banking. Um, obviously, uh, banking is much more um, 
consumer friendly, it has an improved uh, customer experience, but structurally it has not changed from uh, how a bank worked 100 years ago. Yeah, you still have your checkings account, you still have your savings account, how you, how you save for your mortgage, how you pay for that, this all hasn't changed. The only thing has changed is how it is delivered, but ba banking has not been reinvented. Yeah, And uh, frankly, most innovations that came out of the fintech industry, they are not radical at all. It's like you can split a meal amongst friends with your app, Yeah, but this is not reinventing. Uh, banking. So why do we think this happens? Because most um, innovators follow a linear process of understand, explore, and materialize, um, and then they run through that again and again. However, um, it's impacted by uh, cultural conditioning. So especially the observe and the ideate phase, they are um, framed by our uh, cultural understanding. Um, and let me give you an example uh, of that. So on this image, uh, you see the purchase of Manhattan in 1626 by the Dutch for $24. Um, so you could, you could uh, see this image and then think, okay, those are the Europeans exploiting the Native Americans. Um, because how could they give away so much property for so little money? Um, however, the, the point here is that the Native Americans, they didn't have a concept for land ownership. It didn't make any sense that anyone would own land. It simply didn't exist. So this is the cultural concept that Europeans had. Native Americans didn't have and that's really illustrating the power of uh, cultural beliefs. So just try to imagine uh, property ownership or land ownership wouldn't exist in our world. Yeah. So it's, it's totally made up. We invented um, land ownership and we then invented laws to protect that. But essentially it doesn't exist. We made that belief up, right? Um, and this is really one of our human superpowers. Um, since we, we started as a species, we invented fiction, we created fiction, we created shared beliefs. Without shared beliefs, there would be no pyramids, you know, no temples, um, no society, no nations, even our, our nations, they are all fiction, they're all made up. Um, so if we can create incredible fiction, incredible beliefs, we can also hack them, change them, and use them to uh, create radical and systems innovation. Um, okay, let me give you an, another example here, and uh, let's look a bit how a belief can change entire industries. So um, getting old, right? So this is a very strong cultural uh, belief. And in our Western society, um, we think this is something bad. It's something that needs to be slowed, um, averted, or stopped. Yeah, we have anti-aging facial cream. You know, and um, in medicine there is a recent movement where scientists are trying to uh, battle aging. Yeah, so they see aging as a disease that needs to be stopped. Um, as a result, you have uh, a lot of stereotypes and stigmatization around aging. But in different cultures, it's very, they have a totally different view on that, right? So um, in, uh, in Asia, for example, um, older people have um, a much higher status and a, a very different role in society. Um, even in, in Europe, if you look 70, 80 years back, um, the, the role of older people was very different in society than it is today. Yeah. Um, okay, so just uh, think about the, um, the pharma uh, surgical industry and medicine, what their view on, on aging is, what the, the cultural belief is that underpins the whole medical uh, industry. So it's basically to combat aging. It's something bad. 
think about the workplace, how diverse a workplace really is, especially the innovation um, industry, yeah, the, the whole startup industry. It's dominated by young people. Why is that? Because we believe old people can't be innovative, yeah? The fashion and beauty industry, it's all circled around that uh, cultural belief that we have associated with um, age. So uh, cultural beliefs, they're really like water, yeah? So you're this little fish in the fish tank and you don't see the water because you're surrounded by it. You grew up with it. That's how you have been socialized. And it's very difficult to see that, yeah? Um, it's very difficult to imagine um, land ownership does not exist because since we've been alive, it existed, but there are alternatives. It, it's made up. Um, I would like you to uh, post in the chat what beliefs have changed during uh, the COVID pandemic. And please do that now for one minute. And then uh, perhaps I can ask uh, Valeria to um, just tell me a couple of the, the things people post. All right, I have an eye on it. Okay, do we have some? No. We do. Um, uh, Baska Sapkota just posted uh, that personal hygiene has changed thanks to COVID. And just now uh, Magdalena posted that presentialism at work, just on-site on -site work is, is efficient. Ah, yeah. presentialism, now I get it, sorry. Yeah, I was confused about the term. Exactly. Maybe, maybe the first one you want to answer first, yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, the COVID has, has changed or has challenged a lot of core beliefs we have had, we have, we had internalized for many years around work, but also around, um, you know, what, uh, what is a good performance at work. And in the past, it meant even if you're sick, you show up to work. You know, you put the extra hours in. And now this actually means putting other people at risk. And this is not acceptable anymore. Yeah. And I think this is also here to stay. So, and we will only see that in, you know, when the pandemic is hopefully over at some point, then we will see what has changed for good. But I, I'm confident it's many things that have changed. So this is an example that beliefs do change, they can change. Sometimes we need drastic events, but we can also um, use that um, for innovation. And I would like to give you uh, an example. So um, let's look at how we can use that for radical and systems innovation. And um, so believe it or not, this was my first mobile phone, yeah. Um, I'm born in 1981, and um, when I was about 16, 17, everyone had a Nokia phone, yeah, everyone. So Nokia at the time was like Apple phones. They were awesome, yeah. You could even, you know, in school, you could text under your desk because it had actual keyboards and the teachers, they wouldn't notice. So one of the most valuable company um, at the time so this is um, Nokia's product lineup um, from 1982. That's when they started producing uh, phones and they produced hundreds of handsets, yeah? And they had a phone for every possible use case. They had really um, sturdy phones for hiking. They had waterproof phones. You, they had phones for gaming, listening to music, even uh, like a a TV in a phone with a little pullout antenna. Yeah, they had everything. Um, and Nokia's slogan is now know our past, create the future. 
So how did Nokia create the future? Surely by pushing out more and more and more phones, by going for diversity, yeah? So having a phone for every use case. Um, so in 2006, they launched 38 different phones in one year, yeah? This is incredible. This is like per month, they launched three different phones. So think about Apple, they're launching a phone every two years. Nokia launched three phones every month. Incredible. And they were at the top uh, of their hill. Um, this is incremental innovation and the phones got better and better and better. Um, the problem is when you are in a system, um, you often don't see the system, so you focus on the parameters, you focus on the phones. Yeah, surely this, from Nokia's perspective, it was about having the best phone. And then um, what happened was, uh, well, in 2007, Apple only needed one iPhone, which, is, uh, which actually reinvented what a mobile phone would do to beat the 38 phones Nokia had uh, released in the previous year. So what's important to note here that this is a radical innovation because it's a shift of paradigms and you can basically then start climbing a new hill. Yeah, so the, the first Apple phone actually had a worse camera than the best Nokia camera phone. Uh, you couldn't type as fast, um, you know, the it was not waterproof, some of Nokia's phones were, and so on. So it was of inferior quality compared to the uh, best Nokia phone, but um, it had a, a radically different um, interpretation of what a phone is. And since then, Apple is actually doing the same that Nokia did for years, is climbing the, phone, uh, the, the hill with incremental innovations. The phone get they get a bit bigger, they get more cameras and so on, but it's not a radical innovation anymore. And this is potentially risky. So there are many industries out there where the, the key players are on this um, hill climbing pattern. And this means it could be ripe for disruption by reinventing a new hill that an entire industry can then uh, climb. Okay, um, so, and I, I see this a lot in the, the entire innovation um, ecosystem, yeah? Everyone is focused on, um, on being super fast. So we, we work in design sprints, right? And we run workshops. Um, the iteration cycles, they become shorter and shorter and companies push out products in, in two weekly cycles to, to their customers. And it's uh, really the cultural belief like you need to be fast. We need to outrun our competitors. And there's an alternative to that uh, to well, change the rules of the game or invent a new game. You, you need to be brave. You can outthink your competitors and um, you know, develop unique products and services. And they also last longer in the market. They're not outdated as quickly. Uh, in order to facilitate that process, we have a couple of, um, of tools um, that, that first focus on understand the limitations, yeah, to expose some of the cultural beliefs that we have, um, that we have internalized, and then to explore um, possibilities, different possibilities. And from that to systematically develop new opportunities. How am I doing in terms of time? Um, you're at, I think, we're over time. <laughs> over time, okay, sorry, then uh, I'm almost done. So we have a, a, a hacking culture beliefs canvas here. It's the, the first one that can be really useful to um, identify potential topics for that. And uh, let me finish with this quote by Schopenhauer. He's a German philosopher and I couldn't agree more with what he, he said here. The goal should always be to see what others can't, try what others won't and question what others daren't. So let's question some of the beliefs that we have internalized for 
radical and systemic innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. It's really insightful, for sure. And um, I just want to read a couple more of those um, answers towards your question that I didn't get to about how COVID has changed our beliefs. And um, people wrote that, you know, this belief that traveling is essential in certain businesses has changed or people's expectations about the stability of systems has been altered, yeah. as well as our consciousness of our environment, you know, as a static, um, as a static thing. And also the, the relevance of individual action um, that it can make a difference for the whole of society. So if you self-isolate, then the whole society can benefit. And that has brought with it also, um, as somebody wrote, a change of beliefs about the freedom that we enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I just want to say that. Yeah. All right, well do then. Time, do I have time to uh, reply to those or, or not? not sure. really? Yeah, we can yeah. go over time, I'm sure. I, I won't eat into your your time, Ina, um, just really briefly. It's it's super interesting. Huh? And if we think about what is actually the effect that the pandemic had on, on humanity, yeah? Potentially, it's a bit too early to, to say that. But one, um, one effect definitely was to, to slow the race that the spinning wheel that we are all in, right? So it was a, a, a stark halt, at least at the beginning of the, of the lockdown that we experienced in, in spring. So slowing a system down, this changes um, some beliefs or it gives people time to reflect. So this was definitely one, one thing. And I think the other one was to um, also understand how how people are affecting each other and how like the, the whole construct of globalization was before just, okay, we trade with other countries, but now it was like, yeah, it's just sweeping across the, the globe, a virus that started in China and how we are all interconnected, yeah? And yeah, perhaps we, this is also something we can use for systems innovation Maybe there are some interventions we need to put stress on a system to bring it to a stop or to, you know, do something to it for innovation to happen. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting point. It certainly made the systems we live in more tangible to our everyday lives. I agree. All right, Ina, are you ready? Yes, I am. And if Sebastian can stop sharing his screen, I can share mine. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Zina Chilik, and I am part of Climate Kick. Um, and I'm going to share a few insights about our journey as an organization um, towards systems innovation and how we apply it in different contexts. Um, so what I want to start off saying that um, um, Climate Kick ha has been established about 10 years ago um, and is funded by European Institute of Innovation and Technology, which is a body of European Union. And it's part of um, other um, knowledge and innovation communities, uh, which were set up to bring together businesses, research centers, higher education and public sector in order to address some social challenges that were faced. Um, some of this, um, some, some of the kicks are kick digital, kick food, health, uh, in uh, energy manufacturing, raw materials and urban, urban mobility. And when we started 10 years ago, our funding purpose was to tackle climate change for innovation. Um, that's why we established three main pillars, which were education, entrepreneurship, and research and innovation. Um, and we uh, funded to different activities in relation to decarbonization, uh, energy efficiency, sustainable transport, um, clean energy, circular economy, and uh, many other things. And the focus exactly was to boost the, the innovation and in tech thinking in terms of the climate and providing the solutions that would help uh, tackle climate change. 
However, what we realized that despite of all the um, efforts that have been put into the area and lots of lots of investment, um, the, the, the changes are still not enough if we have to uh, tackle um, drastic um, changes that are needed to happen. Uh, uh, according to IPCC reports um, that was published two years ago. So what we realized that gradual incremental changes are not going to be options and they're simply not going to be enough. And that in order to achieve net zero in time, uh, which in terms of uh, um, context of European Union, this huge ambition of European Union to become first climate neutral zone by 2050, in order to do that, we need to um, decarbonize at least six times faster than the global average, which is quite an ambitious goal. Um, so in 2017, we changed our approach. Um, and instead of focusing on incremental changes, we, we started um, introducing radical systems transition and uh, radical uh, systems uh, innovation. Um, introducing system change, a complexity theory, systems thinking in the work that we are doing. And, and uh, yes, with the main idea to move away from the incremental uh, to the transformational um, change, which means that we moved from projecting uh, financially specific projects into creating a portfolio of interdependent projects um, connected together um, and creating really uh, um, synergies between different uh, organizations and, and uh, projects that we are working on, um, creating ecosystems for transformation um, and, and really sharing the learnings from this process. What it means, it means that we uh, put together uh, all aspects of the transformation and, and what, what it means. So uh, working with policy, working with innovative fina finance, working with citizens and engaging citizens in, in the process of innovation, um, using the technology and onboarding startups and um, innovators in this process. Also talk, talking to industry and heavy industry, um, and of course, education and, and developing the skills for the future and uh, green jobs. Um, and for that, we created what we call deep demonstrations, which are intended as an example of what is possible to be achieved in different aspects of um, our human um, uh, systems uh, when the uh, innovation is orchestrated, collaborative, mission land, and demand land. Um, and what it means? Well, it means for us that deep demonstrations are creating uh, innovations to catalyze systems transformation. Um, and they're about connected innovations acting simultaneously to trigger massive leaps in decarbonization and resilience. Um, we also are introducing um, so-called that some, 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 some of you might know uh, the nested, system, nested uh, systems approach, meaning that we're considering all aspects starting from environment, society, and economic system, um, and really focusing on, on creating interlinks and interconnection between um, different experiments that we are um, orchestrating. Um, as Oliver has mentioned, uh, and Sebastian as well, it's, it's about bringing different stakeholders together and really creating the space for all of us and unusual suspects to come together and, and see what are the challenges that we're facing, what are the problems, and how we can introduce different shifts in the system that we're part of in order to start creating the results with, that we actually all want, not the results that nobody wants. Uh, so we work with corporates, we work with startups, with universities, civil society, civil governments, regional governments, and national governments on all level, bringing different stakeholders in the conversation that um, matter. Um, what is our approach? Well, we use a process which is uh, not um, linear, which is 
which is sort of in, in cycles or in loops, and that has been mentioned before as well. And this is part of the systems innovation that, that we're using. So we start with an intent and really focusing on understanding what are the system that we work with, mapping the system and establishing the directionality, knowing where are we going, what, what are the um, areas of intervention that need to happen in order to um, create that shift that, that we need within the system. So uh, from understanding the current reality and where we are right now to uh, what are we trying to achieve and understanding this gap in between and, and creating um, ways how we can through different stepping stones get from this current reality to the vision that um, we have collectively created with our challenge owners. Um, the next step is frame, and it's really about framing this container for innovation to happen and defining uh, and, and uh, what, what are these intervention points, uh, doing a little bit of research on, on these tension points and establishing the principles for our portfolios that uh, we need to have in order to um, create the holistic intervention into the system. The third step is really creating this portfolio of different experiments and creating this ecosystem for them to learn together and grow together and share the knowledge and really collaborate. So, so this the key part here for us is uh, it's, it's not about competition, it's, it's about collaboration. And if we want to create strong um, uh, changes and radical changes in, in the system, which we need right now when it comes to the climate change, and uh, we, we need to work together, all of us together on these challenges. So, so for us, it's really important to unlock this uh, possibilities for collaboration um, and see what emerges out of it. And then of course, um, what we're talking about is creating intelligence or sense making. And it's all, about, it's all about making a pause, looking at where are we going, what has been achieved so far, and thinking, um, are we going in the right direction? Or do we have to change slightly um, our path? And uh, do we have to change our experiments? Do we have to introduce some new experiments into the portfolio. So uh, do we have any gaps um, in on our journey and, and everything in relation to that? And it all goes in circles, in loops. So after the intelligence, we then reconsider again our uh, projects and programs, whether um, everything is happening the way it should or uh, we need some changes. Um, yeah, and uh, so far, uh, we've activated um, six deep demos um, and two more to go. Um, and I'll talk briefly a little bit of, um, about them uh, in shortly. So well, the first of, um, first of all, cities, and, and we all know how important cities are and what a huge influence they have um, when it comes to environment um, and climate change. So in order to support uh, cities to become net zero cities by 2050, we started working with um, some of the cities around Europe to activate this change to, uh, through systems innovation uh, to create those decarbonization um, portfolios um, and uh, support um, municipalities of these cities to transition uh, to net zero um, economies. Um, another deep demo is uh, long-termism and it's, and it's um, as you all might be aware, is this lack of thinking in terms of um, years ahead and and even for now in the in, in business environment when when we talk about long-term thinking uh usually it's about five ten years but when we talk about like long-termism we talk about 50 100 years so what's going to happen with and how can we introduce decisions um in the way uh we work on a daily basis that would influence um, how our uh, how generations ahead of us will live and uh, whether they will have an opportunity to, to fight the way we do. Um, 
so uh, for now we have few partners um, in in Europe working with us on on developing this concept. Um, another important part is about regions and resilient regions, um, because in some uh, regions of Europe, a climate change would create strong. Um, and um, strong challenges for a lot of regions and um, um, involve and make vulnerable a lot of people. And um, the point here is to support those regions so they can start mitigating the changes that are yet to come now and be ready for um, challenges that are gonna happen in the future with them. Um, and once again, we work with some quite progressive uh, challenge owners around Europe on that. Um, next deep demo that I want to talk about is landscapes. And we all know about um, the consequences of uh, industrial, arc, uh, ag um, uh, industrial agriculture. And now then, um, land becoming a source of emission rather than sinks. So we're, we're working with challenge owners on that part in order to create the solutions when um, for, for the soil to become sink again, so we can uh, take out the carbon from the air and put it back into the soil. Uh, and this way we're tackling both uh, enriching the soils and creating stability for our food systems. And at the same time, taking out um, the greenhouse gases out of um, the atmosphere. Um, so in this um, tackling um, some of the problems that we're facing from perspective of climate change. Um, I will not talk about the food but I want to talk a little bit more about just transitions um, of heavy industry regions, because this is the, re uh, the area that I work quite closely in. And uh, here we work with uh, different, different regional governments uh, in Poland and Italy and Spain, helping um, coal region in transition and heavy industry in, in transitions. What it means here is that um, by 2050, um, lots of coal mines in Europe, most of coal, all the coal mines in Europe actually would be closed down, uh, which means that the regions which are heavily dependent on mining uh, will have to um, go for significant transformation. So we're working with this region, helping uh, to prepare them uh, for this transition working in different areas, starting from reskilling the workers um, and uh, looking at the other um, economic opportunities uh, that might uh, be needed in order to make this transition smoother um, and, and really uh, cre creating the space for transformation to happen in involving different stakeholders, um, including trade unions, um, uh, citizens, uh, industry, um, to create the social, economic, and also environmental uh, transformation that needs to happen. Circle economy is another big part um, of the work that we do. And here we partner with governments on Slovenia and Bulgaria, um, and both have ambition to become both these nations have ambition to become fully circular. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a huge ambition. There's a lot to go, um, but we're excited to introduce uh, systems innovation in, in these processes as well. And last but not the least, we work with maritime hubs, uh, so ports um, across the Europe. Um, and we all know how consumerism is deeply affecting um, the way uh, our environment is um, struggling. So working with ports gives us this leverage um, to decarbonize the ports and through them to also influence the supply chain. Uh, right, and uh, I think my time is up. So I'd rather stop uh, here and uh, willing to take any questions you might have. And thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Ina. That was also a really insightful presentation. And um, 
I'm going to shift this uh, webinar towards the discussion part and uh, go straight in because we don't have that much time anymore. Actually, we're just at the hour. <laughs> but um, I appreciate more in-depth uh, demonstrations of, of what you've been doing. So I think it's worthwhile. And uh, one of the questions in the audience that was posed very early to Oliver was, how did you get the right best fit collaboration partners on board of your projects? Just you. Yes. Um... Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a good one. It's a very relevant one. Whom do we actually work with? How do we identify the right stakeholders? Um, so we have to, I have to say Endeva is uh, the organization I'm working with is active over 10 years already in this field. We used to work more in the field of startups and development agencies. Um, and uh, um, by doing so, we have built a very vast network across the globe in all countries that are involved. So uh, one part of the answer really is we have a big network that one of the big parts of our process is really, we can help the organization to find and to curate the right stakeholders. The ones that, that have complementary needs and problems to the challenge and to the opportunity that we're pursuing. Um, so this is, this is a big part of it. Um, um, and, uh, um, yeah, when engaging with, with many stakeholders, you always kind of ask forward. So if you already identified an organization that is active on the ground, that, that does something that, that is interesting and that, that will have a nice opportunity, uh, uh, perspective, we ask, whom else do we should talk, uh, should we talk to? And, and by that, you basically ask forward, and that's one of the works that Endeva is doing, right, finding and curating the right and complementary stakeholders. So that's part of our job, basically. Thank you. I was just thinking that, um, I mean, Climate Kick needs to work with so many stakeholders as well. So stakeholder mapping must be a part of it. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we use system mapping a lot, um, especially in the first uh, stage of um, the process. And it's, it's it, it, like the systems map that we create are quite um, diverse and like really big. Uh, we use a specific software to, to generate this information um, and to in include uh, different stakeholders in these maps. Um, and they have been like really useful in all the cases. The only caveat that I wanna share regarding systems map is, is that systems map are just a snapshot um, and a tiny representation of it. They don't give the full understanding how, how system um, work because as we all know from systems innovation theory is that uh, systems are dynamic and they're always changing. And it's all so a lot about um, interrelationships between them. So we create systems map and they're helpful at a certain point, but we also go back to them throughout um, the process to, to see if, if we're missing some things or if some learnings are enriching the, the maps that, that we're using. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, the next question is by Magdalena. She says, it's also to Oliver, as you mentioned greenwashing, is there a process in place in Endeavor to ensure the customer is honestly looking for a systemic innovation and not just a sustainability tick in the box? Yes, this is a very good question and this is a very one that uh, yeah, many people ask because uh, many people are uh, very uh, critical when it comes to companies now saying, all right, we have purpose, we do something for the world, and we should be critical. There's many, many organizations that just do these things for greenwashing. How do we approach this uh, at Endeavor? Well, first of all, um, we... In the beginning, we work only with companies that already have shown that they kind of take it serious, right? That we know the people inside, we uh, know that they uh, have a real intent uh, to, to push uh, impact projects forward. Um, and uh, when, we, when we reach out to companies or when we uh, uh, start conversations, uh, when, when, they, when they reach out to us, is we always check, do they have kind of impact programs already? Do they... Do they uh, have a really chief sustainability officer? Do they, do they kind of mean it seriously or is this really just a company that, that uh, wants to do some greenwashing? But we cannot find everything and uh, uh, 
Um, uh, that's why throughout the entire process, we always integrate back in the system perspective. We as Endeavor, we are usually the moderators and the facilitators of this entire process. So we can make sure that the uh, conversations and the, uh, the, the process goes in the right direction, goes towards a solution that is that is systemic and goes towards a solution that pays uh, forward to the SDGs, for example. So we have these metrics always in mind and bring them back up again. Ultimately, we cannot tell any organization what they should do, right? We have to kind of give them, present them the solution which can be implemented on a systemic level, a, a solution that has impact, um, but we, we cannot force them to do this. Um, that's why we try to highlight the benefits and try to highlight the benefits in a way that we connect it to the value chain of the organization. We tell them, all right, this, this has benefits for you when it comes to your greenwashing agenda, yes, but it also has concrete uh, um, and actionable business um, benefits for you, for your profit and loss statement, for your bottom line. This is not easy to do, but this is part of our work. And uh, we're not 100% there yet, but with every project and with every new partner, we realize um, it's possible. We just uh, have to continue doing it. And um, yeah, this is uh, the way we, we approach it right now. Yeah. I think yeah, it's very interesting how um, it's not super easy to construct this win-win, like this obvious benefit for businesses that systems innovation actually can provide. And yeah, yeah that's also part of it for sure. Um, and the last thing maybe, uh, just to add to that, um, usually the solutions, for example, if there's a business model that comes out in the end, right? Uh, um, usually we, they, they don't have a, a ownership for just this corporation. It's kind of a public good for the entire collaborative group. So for all stakeholders involved, and uh, it's, it's accessible and usable for all of them. Um, um, and uh, yeah, that's also a way to ensure that, you know, it's not one organization that just capitalizes on the stakeholders and then just runs alone. Uh, we try to um, uh, foster these partnerships afterwards by making these uh, things usually available to the entire group. All right, this is a question for Sebastian. Um, Biggie asks, how do you sync cultural beliefs during ideation stage of an opportunity of a project? Sorry, what was it? How do I? How do you sync cultural beliefs during the ideation stage? I, I mean, I'm assuming, yeah, they mean to construct the same cultural belief to make that happen, I suppose. Yeah, um, so it needs to happen before we get to the ideation phase, yeah? Um, Maybe let me just give you give you an example there. Um, let's take uh, public transport, right? So this is basically it's a system, public transport, um, or in general how people move. It's a it's a system, and you can apply a systems approach. Um, we would first start by uncovering what are the actual unhidden or unconscious beliefs that we have internalized. And a, a big one is, uh, for example, punctuality, yeah? So that buses need to be on time, trains need to be on time, that this is the number one requirement for our public transport system, yeah? This is a belief. Um, there are many alternatives to that, yeah? And I know this from, from a project that I worked on myself and, you know, just changing uh, timetables at bus stops by not displaying the exact time when a bus uh, departs, but by um, by um, displaying the cycle that the bus runs on. Yeah, so let's say every five minutes or every ten minutes, and this is a small hack. It's a small cultural hack that um, affects punctuality. But before we come up with ideas like that, we basically need to be able to reimagine alternative systems. Otherwise, we're just innovating little bits and pieces inside the current system. Yeah. And this is very difficult. So we need to expose our beliefs first, create radical alternatives to that, and then see, okay, what alternative system would be the output of new beliefs? So I would even claim 
without new beliefs, it's very, very difficult to, to get to uh, a systems change. Yeah, You need to update your software in your brain first before you can think different and create something different. All right, thank you. Maybe as a follow-up, um, Vicky also asked, how would you marry politics and cultural beliefs with systems thinking and systems innovation? Um, so there's a big, uh, there is a big link to politics. Um, however, it's, it's also a bit of a dangerous link. Yeah. Um, so I see the topic of cultural beliefs on uh, th at least three different levels. So they exist on an individual level. Yeah, we all have uh, certain beliefs about ourselves, about the world, um, but this is really a focus area for, um, for example, psychotherapists. Yeah, they work on cultural beliefs. Yeah, and they've done this since uh, psychotherapy existed, and but then it also exists on a team or organizational level, plus it even exists on a society level. So you could even say like nations, um, they also have certain cultural beliefs about what is important, yeah? And when you travel uh, to other countries, you see they are vastly different. And sometimes you see some even radical parties in politics who have very opposing uh, beliefs, yeah? And they try to uh, force a systems change, um, sometimes successful, as we have seen, for example, with Donald Trump, he is a even even if you might not agree with his politics, but he's a cultural creative, yeah, and he changed the system, um, probably for the worse. But uh, there is a very strong link there. But we don't want to focus on the individual or the politics, but on organizational um, and team level. All right, staying with the theme of politics is a question for Ina. It says, um, what role does politics play uh, in systems innovation, especially related to climate kick projects? So the same question back to you. Yeah, well, as you can imagine, like um, when it comes especially to policy, there's a huge part, part in that. And most, most of the challenge owners that we work with are um, either municipalities on local uh, region or um, governments of uh, uh, countries like Slovenia and Bulgaria. We also work quite closely with the European Union, um, advising on a lot of uh, policies when it comes to um, climate. So yes, the, these things come hand in hand uh, together. Um, and there's a lot of politics involved. Um, but at the same time, as, as I've mentioned before, it's not just about politics and it's not just about bringing politicians um, on, on, in this conversation. Uh, creating this bridge and creating um, the connection to the citizens and to the businesses and to innovation communities um, and uh, trade unions um, and, and other stakeholders involved in these processes and in systems that we work with is the key for us. So, um, and, and it's, it's, of course, you can imagine it can be quite a challenging and daunting task to create the space for this uh, conversation to happen. Yet, um, in our view, it is um, the, one of the ways how we can actually make the change happen um, and not create beautiful reports in terms of what has to happen. Um, uh, and um, they, they never never turn out to be implemented. So it's it's really creating it's a, really about creating this dialogue between different stakeholders to come together and and try to uh, test different solutions and experiment what actually works and learn from these experiments and iterate and and again and again iterate to to come eventually to the solutions. Um, and to shift in the system that would start bringing the results that we want rather than we don't. Yeah, really interesting. I think personally, politics also plays a huge role with systems innovation because they have more power to effect, like to punctuate leverage points. It's a it's a greater transformative power that politics can use. Um, 
And if we change uh, the way that governance uh, interacts with these problems, then we can hopefully create more transformative change in society as well. Um, so, Maybe I can yeah, quickly sure. one, one last sentence, because we work with the politic, uh, stakeholders from politics too. So for example, uh, um, when I was talking about these drones that deliver goods and critical medicine to remote areas, we had to integrate politics, politicians as well, because um, it was very, yeah, the, the legal situation was very unclear and it was very unclear how, uh, what, what is even allowed and uh, is the solution that we're trying to build, is this even allowed? And if not, uh, um, what, what needs to change? So we integrated them in the process very early on already. And um, we helped them to, uh, uh, you know, to, to explore, uh, so we create an analysis of uh, different kind of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that, that ultimately showed us a lot of requirements also for the, for the uh, legislative side. Um, and um, yeah, so for us, it's also always, not always, but in most cases, uh, important to have some stakeholders from the politics side and to take them on the journey so that we basically can learn together how to build solutions, not to come and give them a final report, that's it, please do, nothing's gonna happen. But if you integrate them very early on and uh, uh, have the right stakeholders from the, from the government on board, uh, then things can move. So that's, that's our experience. Cool. Yeah. I guess also, yeah. Yeah, if I'd like to just build up on that, because I think it's one of the key aspects of systems innovation, just like really not coming up with, with specific solutions, uh, but allowing the space for emergence to happen um, and, and um, yeah, create, creating the space uh, for, um, for experiments to, to go through and, and learn from this experience and, and if necessary to adapt and change the strategy uh, rather than having rigid plans of how things should be and then them failing in the end. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Really important addition. So I want to ask a bit more uh, general questions about systems innovation as an, a toolkit. So what are the biggest application challenges that systems innovation faces? I can start. Um, well, from our experience, the biggest challenge so far is to explain to our challenge owners and, and, and people that we work with what it is and why it is important to, to do it that way and why can't we just tell them what to do um, and, uh, yeah, and to create this process of learning together um, to come up with something that makes sense to everyone, that everybody can say, yes, I can stand behind it, this make, and I would, I would do everything that I um, can in order to support uh, implementation of it. Um, so yes, and, and there's a lot of confusion, like um, uh, when we work with people to really understand some, some of the key concepts and what it means, and like, especially when it comes to collaboration, people are not really used to collaborate together. Um, and listen to each other properly, like other, yeah. So um, it, it's really interesting um, work, I, I have to admit. I can uh, add to that, so I can, I can completely underline what uh, Ina just said, really it's understanding what are we actually talking about here. It's, this is a field that is filled with a lot of buzzwords uh, and uh, it's system, system, it's very, untangible what, what that actually means. And, and at least I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this for, from the business perspective, right? Not, not the team, but at least from the business perspective, this is a critical thing. If you talk to someone in a, in a, in a corporation that has been there for 15 years, he's wondering why should we as a company engage in, in, on the system level, right? We, we have design thinking, we have to focus on our customer, customer, customer. This is a completely different mindset this, uh, I think, uh, Hacking this mindset would be uh, something that is required, uh, and um, that's something I'm seeing when you talk to them. There's a whole different set of vocabularies. They don't use system thinking. They, they, you know, it's 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 it's, it's different kind of way what you have to communicate and, and what it's all about. I think most companies realize that. Well, yes, for the big picture, that would be a good thing. But how is this a good thing for me? So why should I invest money and people and 
time in this and, and my resources. And drawing this connection is key. Uh, and this is one of the big uh, challenges to, uh, to, to bring system thinking and systems innovation really to, to, the, to the corporate field is finding the connection to what does that mean for you? Why do you benefit? Or why can you benefit from it? Or which risks can you mitigate using it? Um, and I think the awareness is coming slowly, but hopefully step by step we're working towards making that happen. Oh wait, I, I think Sebastian wants to say something about this, but you're on mute. That again, uh, if I may, I would like to add to, to your point, um, Oliver. And I think a big, a big barrier to systems innovation is um, our low maturity and very limited understanding of systems, yeah? And this starts very early in our socialization within school, when you pick topics, it's all segmented and you, you're supposed to specialize in one field, yeah? When you study, there are, there are not many things you can study or have a career where you look at systems, yeah? You're only ever looking at a very, detailed thing yeah and you're the master at that thing and um, that is not helping us with um, understanding complex systems yeah if we are too focused we need to open up yeah but they're not even there's no education on how to do that well i know the systems innovation hub is uh, working on that to change that which is awesome but this also needs to start in schools yeah how we grow up with what worldview and what beliefs. Yeah, I mean, I think you mentioned, you all mentioned some uh, solutions for this, but sorry for the noise. Um, what are the main, um, those main barriers? How can we transcend them? How could we change our local ecosystems, for example, so that we can um, have an easier time applying uh, systems innovation? So maybe, to start off, what, uh, what is a big thing is to really continue the conversations with the different kind of people that are necessary to apply system innovation, right? What we preach in system thinking is like talking to these people and this is how we have to find out how to solve this problem of solving big problems. Uh, so for me, it's really about, I'm speaking, I have to speak with corporate people and be on the conferences that they are in and, and try to, connect and understand what is their take and uh, discuss uh, further with them how we, uh, how we can solve these problems because I think there's many uh, complementary uh, views and objectives in this. So they kind of want it and need it as well. We do it as well, politics uh, as well. And um, yeah, we, we have to connect better, not just within our system innovation uh, bubble where people already know what it is. It has to go way beyond. and. Uh, for this, uh, yeah, clear and simple uh, explanations help. But this is difficult to do, I know, uh, to explain this, uh, but uh, yeah, this is something we, we have to continue working on and making the message clear and sharp and to be able to continue conversations. Would anybody else, um, has anybody else some ideas about what is the way forward for us to to create a more, um, yeah, like, like, you know, good environment, I suppose, uh, to propel systems thinking forward. Yeah, um, I would say that from perspective of climate kick, it's really about, like, yes, it's, it's important to educate and to talk about it and to introduce these concepts on different levels uh, and in different uh, um, uh, social institutions. But at the same time, it's also important to, create examples and showcases of practical examples of like what happens when it when we actually implement it in reality. So people can uh, not just in theory talk about how beneficial it would be, but see uh, the outcomes in practice. And by creating those spaces, um, yeah, it will enable us to create this even stronger case for systems innovation because we would be able to show the impact of it. And this is what we're trying to do with deep demonstration programs uh, in Climate Kick. 
Yeah, that's super cool. You have a, a better pathway into in the people's minds and um, to explain systems innovation, I guess, is a big takeaway for sure. And um, I guess I want to finish this uh, panel discussion now with uh, one last question. Uh, so what were your biggest aha moments with systems innovation? What was it that, that got you convinced that this is really the way forward? <laughs> maybe, maybe I can start. Mm -hmm. uh, so when, when I was, I'm, I'm, I have a business background rather, right? So kind of from business school and when I was starting uh, working with Endeva and trying to get my head around system thinking, uh, or not, system thinking actually came after, but when I was starting there, I was like, well, yeah, let's, there, there can be so many cool business models that a company can do, right? We can connect business with impact and, and there's so many things we can do. And the more I saw what happened uh, in the last years and the more examples I read about is they cannot do it alone. No way, no business, no individual actor, it doesn't matter how big he is, he's not going to shift the needle with one uh, cool impact uh, business model. It is about collaboration. And if we want to have collaboration across sectors, system thinking is for me the approach to take because this is the fundamental, uh, it's living out of co collaboration. It's based on collaboration. It's based on bringing different people together. And uh, um, for me, this is like a new, new way of thinking about uh, uh, solving problems. Uh, and uh, this is uh, something that is done collaboratively. And this is something I realized no individual organization will do it alone. They have to work together. All right, thank you. Uh, do you want to speak, Ina? Um, just, just to build up on that and so what Oliver already mentioned that, yeah, the wicked problems that we're facing collectively as humankind are so massive and so big that it is really imposs impossible to tackle them like separately by se separate uh, governments or separate like institutions or just business like we really we really have to learn and, and embrace what is collaboration and I have a business background as well um, and in my previous life when I was a consultant uh, working back in London um, it was really like it was all about creating ex expertise and learning so much and like really uh, stepping into this expert mode and the first time when I actually had an opportunity to experience what true collaboration means, and when I saw the results of this work, I was just fascinated. It just, I just came to realization that no matter how knowledgeable our experts are, when they, when they work separately from their own perspective, they still don't see the systems as it is. They see just one side of the system, one tiny fraction of uh, a bigger system and how it operates. So it is impossible, like, like that story of, of a blind man and an elephant, right? Uh, they're all touching different parts of an elephant and, and saying, oh, this is, a, this is a snake or this is a column or this is something else, but reality is bigger. And in order to, to really see um, the complexity um, of the system that we're part of, we need to, to bring in those different perspectives in one. We need to collaborate together to see more clearly how the system works and then find the leverage points how we can influence so the system start producing the results that we actually want, not the negative ones that we are experiencing collectively. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said, Ina. I think that's a good final uh, speech unless anybody else has something to share. Um, so I guess I'll stop this uh, webinar now. Uh, thank you to everybody who was watching, uh, to everybody who commented and was involved. And of course, thank you to uh, the three panelists that were really uh, gave us a great insight into systems innovation as it is happening in Berlin and all around the world and cities everywhere. And um, this was part of a webinar series that is starting of the uh, Berlin Systems Innovation Hub um, in here. And we're just launching now to to create the space to learn about systems thinking, to learn about systems innovation 
and to collaborate on systemic problems and develop toolkits so that we can locally in our city um, tackle wicked problems and other complex challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Valeria. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sebastian Thank Oliver. You. It's been a yeah, pleasure. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Thank you.